to the Foundational Biblical Teaching Ministry, Jesus in Genesis broadcast. The mission of the Foundational Biblical Teaching Ministry is to encourage Christians and non-believers to study the Word of God so they will be able to know what they believe and why they believe it. Our mission is to equip God's people for the work of serving and building. Welcome everyone to the Foundational Biblical Teaching Ministry, Jesus in Genesis broadcast. My name is Dr. Van Pennington. Come on in. You're right on time. And we're here every week at this time. And next week, we want you to bring your whole church, everybody you know. And also, tell them to please share this video. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says, The gifts that he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some evangelists and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the building up of the body of Christ. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And yes, I will be with you always, even until the ends of the earth. So what am I saying by using those two scriptures to start off our lesson for today? What I'm saying is that the teaching ministry is an important part of the body of Christ. We need to be able to know what we believe, and we need to know why we believe it. So the foundational biblical teaching ministry has been created for that express purpose, to prepare the body of Christ to become effective witnesses to save souls for Christ. By the way, we have a website at www.foundationalbtm.org. Go there and you will see three different types of lessons. We have written Bible lessons out, we have audio podcast Bible lessons, and we have archive our broadcasts that you see on this station all there on our website. Why? Because we want you to know what you believe and we want you to know why you believe it. Today's lesson is called Principles Used in the Canon of Scripture. Principles Used in the Canon of Scripture. We have a few questions that we're going to talk about in today's lesson. Question number one, what principles were used that included the 66 books that we have in the Holy Bible? Another question that we're going to answer today is, are there differences between the Jewish Bible, the Christian Bible, and the Catholic Bible? We're going to talk about the differences and the similarities between those three Bibles. Another question we're going to answer today, what is the intertestamental period of time? And what impact did the books that were written during the intertestamental period have on the books that are included in our Holy Bible? And one last question. Are there any lost books in the Bible? So we have a few things to talk about today. So once again, come on in, have a seat. Feel free to take notes. Uh, we're here for you every Sunday at this time. There's a couple of scriptures let's start off with first. Jude. Jude chapter 1 verse 3 says, We should always contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. So we have a job to always be ready to give an answer to anyone about the hope that is within us. Always be able to contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. We need to know what we believe and we need to know why we believe it. Another scripture I need to share with you, John 10, 27. Jesus is speaking here, and he says, My sheep know my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So those are key scriptures. When we hear the word of God being written or read to us, and we hear the word, we know God's word. We know the books that should be included, and when we hear God's word, we know the books that should not be included. So with that being said, a couple more things before we jump right in. The canon. Uh, the canon is a rule or standard or principle that's used in church matters. One more time. A canon, C-A-N-O-N, is a standard or a rule that's used in matters regarding the church. Now the canon of scripture talks about the standards or principles that were used to include the 66 books than in the Holy Bible. So with that being said, let's jump right into today's lesson. Okay, let's talk about the principles used in the canon of Scripture. Once again, let's review our questions for today's lesson. Uh, what principles were used to include the 66 books that make up our Holy Bible? What are the differences between the books contained in the Christian, also known as the Protestant Bible, or the Jewish Bible, which is called the Tanakh, and the Roman Catholic Bible? What are the differences 
uh, between those three books. Another question we're going to uh, take on today, what is the intertestamental period and why are the books written during that period not included in the Christian, also known as the Protestant Holy Bible? And then finally, are there any lost books that should be included in the Holy Bible? I'm glad you asked. Let's get started. Um, we gave you a couple of scriptures already, Jude uh, chapter 1, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. So the Bible was already given to us. We have to defend it. We know what should be in it, and we know what should not be in it. We should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the sheep. In John 10, 27, Jesus Christ is talking. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So the faith that we should earnestly contend for is the truth found in the Holy Scriptures. As Christians, we must be clear on exactly what is Scripture so we can accurately determine biblical truths from biblical error. A canon refers to a rule or law or standard uh, regarding matters concerning the church. The canon of scripture refers to standards used to determine which books were included in the Holy Bible. It should be noted that men did not decide the canon of scripture. Church leaders were inspired by the Holy Spirit in determining the books that were included in the canon and brought about God's will to form a Holy Bible. Early church councils when considering which books to be included in the Bible, had several principles that aided their decisions. So let's look at the principles of the canon of Scripture. Uh, first of all, did the Holy Spirit inspire the writings? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all Scripture, not some Scripture, not most Scripture, not just the Old Testament, not just the New Testament, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So remember that. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. And 2 Peter says it also. In 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible made claims about the Bible, okay? The Bible claims that all scripture in the Bible is God-breathed or given by inspiration from God. And one of the greatest proofs of the Bible's inspiration is prophecy. So that's one of the principles of the canon of scripture, prophecy. Let's talk about that. Was prophecy contained in the Bible? A prophecy is a message from God to a designated spokesperson of God that communicates an action that God will perform at some time in the future. The authors of the Old Testament mention numerous prophecies made by God, and the New Testament authors mention numerous prophecies made or fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Just in the book of Isaiah alone, not counting the other 38 books in the Old Testament, uh, but just in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. There are 120 prophecies that Isaiah made that were fulfilled by Jesus Christ in the New Testament, just in that one book in the Bible. Okay, for example, here's a prophecy that Isaiah made in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And the fulfillment of that prophecy was in the New Testament. Matthew 1, 21-33. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So you will find prophetic statements made in most of the Old Testament books. Fulfilled prophecy is a powerful compelling evidence for the authority, the inspiration, and the reliability of Scripture. So the prophecy principle is met by the books in the Holy Bible. Uh, another principle for the canon of Scripture, did the authors, authors reference or quote God when they wrote their books? 
almost all of the Old Testament books contain direct references or quotations from God or mention specific tasks that God told them to undertake. In all the New Testament books, either reference or contain direct quotations from Jesus Christ. For example, here's the first quotation of God found in Genesis 1-3. And God said, let there be light. And guess what? There was light. Okay. So, uh, so the authors are referencing or quoting God in their writings of one of the uh, principles for seeing if the books are inspired that were included in the 66. Okay. Here's the last reference to Jesus Christ. And the last quotation from Jesus found in Revelation. For I testify to every man that hears the words of prophecy in this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. And he which testifies to these things says, Surely I come quickly, amen, even so come Lord Jesus. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the reference of quoting God principle is met by the books contained in the Holy Bible. Let's look at another uh, uh, principle. Is an internal agreement between the books in the Bible. First uh, Corinthians 14.33 says, For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace, as in all the churches in, of the saints. So what am I saying? I'm saying that if the books in the Bible are all inspired by God, God does not contradict himself. So all the books should be in agreement. That's what I'm saying, and that's how you find out the ones that would meet uh, the standard to be included in the 66. The books in the Holy Bible are in internal agreement if they refer to and confirm scriptures found in the other books. Since all scripture is God-breathed, the writings are consistent and coherent. You can cross-reference major biblical doctrines, characters, and events within the collection of the 66 books. For example, let's look at Matthew. Matthew 24, 36 to 39. This is Jesus Christ talking about his uh, the return, okay? And he said, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah, so also will be the coming of man. When Christ returns, he's already making a comparison with Noah in the Old Testament. That's internal agreement. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all the way, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. So in this passage of the Scripture, talking about internal agreement, Jesus is talking about his return, but he references Noah and the flood. So he's saying the flood took place. The flood was not some fish story, okay? Uh, Christ is confirming that it took place. Uh, and also, this is an example of Scripture confirming Scripture. There are over 250 separate references to Old Testament Scriptures found in the New Testament. The New Testament writers quote from 34 of the 39 books in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ himself quoted from 24 different Old Testament books. So the canonized collection of books contained in the Holy Bible clearly meet the internal agreement principle. Now, another principle or standard, uh, are the books powerful, dynamic, and able to change the life of the reader? Hebrews says it this way, Hebrews 4.12, Indeed, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides the soul from the spirit, the joints from the marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. What am I saying? I'm saying that all of the 66 books in our Holy Bible are living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The scriptures are more than words that have been written and placed in the book. The scriptures are private letters addressed to you by God. The scriptures contain the actual voice of God jumping off the page and speaking directly to you. The scriptures make it very personal. The scriptures will guide and instruct you into all truth. So, the books contained in the Holy Bible meet the powerful, dynamic, and able to change the life of the reader principle. And my conclusion of this, uh, part one of this uh, uh, lesson, the 39 books of the Old Testament 
and the 27 in the New Testament are all inspired and God breathed. They contain numerous prophecies. They were written by holy men of God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The books reference or directly quote God or Jesus Christ. The 66 books of the Holy Bible are internally consistent. They confirm each other. The books are living, they are powerful, and they are sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, now, let's move on to another question. Uh, let's do a comparing and contrasting. Uh, what are the similarities and differences between uh, the Christian Bible, also known as the Protestant Bible, the Jewish Bible, also known as the Tanakh, and the Roman Catholic Bible. So let's uh, compare and contrast the three. First of all, you look at all three of the Bibles. Uh, one thing that they clearly have in common is they all agree that the 39 books in the Old Testament are inspired by God. It's very interesting. The Christian Bible has 39 books, the same 39 the Jewish Bible have in the Old Testament. And not only the Christian Bible and the Jewish Bible have the same 39 Old Testament books, the Roman Catholic Bible has the same 39 Old Testament books. So what am I saying? I'm saying there's no debate there in terms of the inspiration of the 39 books in the Old Testament. There's debate about the other books <laughs> in the Bible, but not about the 39. Okay, so that's clear. There's no argument there. Now, uh, in the uh, Christian Bible, also known as the Protestant Bible, there's 27 New Testament books. So there's a total of 66 books in the Christian Bible. The Jewish Bibles, you probably know, they deny that Jesus is God, so therefore the New Testament is written about Jesus, and they don't want to hear that. So they only have the Old Testament, so they only have 39 books. And that's another lesson for another day, but nonetheless, that's the bottom line. The Roman Catholic Bible agrees with the Christian Bible in that there are 39 Old Testament books and 27 New Testament books. They agree on that totally. The difference between the Christian Bible and the Catholic Bible are the seven additional books that the Roman Catholics say are inspired by God and should be included with the same weight and authority as the other 66 books. So when you have the 66 with the 7 that they added, that's why they have 73 books. What are those uh, 7 uh, books that they've added that uh, neither the Christian Bible or the Jewish Bible have in their books, in their Bibles? That's the uh, book of Tobit, Judith, 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, Sirach, and by Sirach, also is known also as the Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes, okay? Not to be confused, okay? And also Wisdom and Baruch. So let me run that by you one more time. The seven books that the Roman Catholics contend uh, are inspired by God and have been included in the books that the Jewish and the Christians say are not inspired by God and are not in their Bibles, those seven books are Tobit, Judith, 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, Sirach, Wisdom, and Baruch. So they have 73 books. So that's the comparing and contrasting. Let's go a little bit deeper into that, right? Uh, let's go back to the Old Testament, uh, where, where we're all in agreement. All three uh, Bibles are in agreement about the Old Testament. Malachi. Malachi was the last prophet in the Old Testament. Book number 39 of the 39 Old Testament books was the book of Malachi. There's four chapters that Malachi wrote in that book. In the last chapter of the book of Malachi, chapter 4, uh, verses 5 and 6, he says the following prophecy. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Okay, that's the last prophecy. What, what is uh, Malachi saying? He's saying that, that uh, in the, before the Lord comes uh, of that great and dreadful day, that there will be another prophet uh, like Elijah that will come forth. And guess what Luke said uh, in Luke uh, uh, one seventeen? It fulfilled the prophecy of Malachi. And it said, And he shall go forth before him in the spirit of and the power of Elijah. Now, Elias, E-L-I-A-S, is also Elijah. It's spelled differently. But that's the, uh, so once again, he shall go forth before him in the spirit of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Uh, so, let's okay. continue. Uh, the last word spoken by God in the Old Testament was Malachi, and that prophecy was fulfilled, once again talking about internal agreement, uh, in uh, the uh, book of Luke with John the Baptist. So, Matthew's last prophecy was written in 420 B.C. The preaching of John the Baptist was around 25 A.D. So this rough, uh, roughly 400 year period of time, when God was silent, and there was no prophecy, no prophet, and no prophetic word from God. It's called the intertestamental period, or the period of time after the end of the Old Testament and before the beginning of the New Testament. It's called the intertestamental period. So, as you probably know, Christianity grew out of Judaism. And although their Bibles are arranged in a different sequence, the Christian Bible and the Jewish Tanakh Bible both contain the same 39 Old Testament books. The Christians and the Jews agree that God spoke through prophets. The Christian and Jews agree that the last Old Testament prophet was Malachi. The Christian and Jews agree that there was no prophet or no prophecy during the 400-year intertestamental period when God was silent. So therefore, what are they saying? That whatever was written in during that period of time was not from God. That's basically what this is saying, okay, where, where I'm going with this. But let's continue. So uh, let's talk about the reasons for excluding a few books from the Bible. It was during this 400-year intertestamental period when God was silent and there was no prophet no prophecy from God that books were written called the Apocrypha, A-P-O-C-R-Y-P-H-A, which is the Greek word which means the hidden things. Now, seven of these books, there are a number of them, there's more than seven, but seven of the Apocrypha books are included in the Roman Catholic Bible. That's Tobit, Judith, 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, Baruch, Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes. And wisdom. The other books of the Apocrypha are the first and second of Cedra, additions to Esther, the letter of Jeremiah, the song of the three holy children, Susanna, Bell and the dragon, additions to the book of Daniel, and the prayer of Manasseh. Okay, so the Apocrypha books are excluded from the Christian Holy Bible and the Jewish Bible because they did not meet the above mentioned standards for canonicity. They were written during a period of time when God was silent and since we're saying all scriptures God breathed, then God didn't breathe it. And since God didn't breathe it, it should not be included in the book. Okay, basically. The Roman Catholic Church has included these seven books of the Apocrypha and maintained that these books are inspired scripture and carry the same authority as the 39 Old Testament books that are canonized in the Christian and the Jewish Bible. Okay, that's what we're saying. Okay, none of the writers of the Apocrypha claim their writings were inspired by God. Very interesting. Uh, the, the Catholic Church says that they're inspired by God, but the writers who wrote them said that they were not inspired. Okay, but nonetheless, the Jews never acknowledged the Apocryphal books as scripture or being inspired the apocryphal books contain statements that contradict foundational biblical Christian doctrine found in the 66 books. Remember we talked about this principle called internal agreement. God is not an author of confusion. God would not write one thing in one book and then totally contradict himself in, a, in another book. And that's what you find in these books of the apocrypha. Okay? For example, apocryphal writers maintain that you can be saved after death through a sin offering. So in other words, once you die, if you can pay some money, you can be saved. So that is very lucrative and beneficial to the Catholic Church, okay? Because now they can preach that doctrine and people will give money for the dead, okay? Uh, but that's not what the scriptures say. So that's one example of what the apocryphal writers are putting in these books, okay? The apocryphal writers claim and encourage believers to pray for the dead for their salvation, Apocryphal writers claim that the cross of Christ could talk uh, and that demons had sex with women. 
the apocryphal writers maintain that you are saved by your works or good deeds and that the believers can defeat the work of Satan through witchcraft. The apocryphal writers also claim that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was immaculately conceived and was sinless. As such, Catholics pray to Mother Mary for forgiveness of sins. The apocryphal writers teach immoral practices including lying, suicide, and magical incantation. There are over 250 New Testament references to the various books in the Old Testament, but there are no references to the apocryphal books in the New Testament. For the above stated reasons, the apocryphal books have been excluded from our Holy Bible. Let's continue. There's another group of books during the intertestamental period when God was silent and there was no prophet and no prophecy from God. And this classification of books are called the pseudepigraphal writings. And that's a Greek word that means false name. So these are fake books. Okay? Um, the pseudepigraphal books are books that attempt to imitate the Word of God that are written under false names. The pseudepigrapha comes from the Greek word pseudo, meaning false, and epigraphin, which means to inscribe. So the pseudepigrapha means to write falsely or false writing. So these are clearly fakes. Okay? The pseudepigraphal books were written anywhere between 200 B.C. to A.D. 300. These books were written by unknown authors who attempted to gain legitimacy by tacking on the name of a famous biblical character to their writings. Uh, these books include the Epistle of Barnabas, the first and second epistle of Clement to the Corinthians, the letter to the Smyrnians, also known as the martyrdom of Polycarp, the shepherd of Hermas, the book of Enoch, the gospel of Judas. Think about that, the gospel of Judas. Jesus Christ said he was a demon and a, a liar and a thief and a son of perdition, but now he's got the gospel, the gospel of Judas the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of the Psalms of Solomon, and the Odes of Solomon. The other pseudepigraphal books are the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, Second Baruch, the Books of Adam and Eve, the Acts of Philip, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Gospel of the Nativity of Mary, the Gospel of Nicodemus, the Gospel of the Savior's Infancy, the History of Joseph the Carpenter, the Acts of Paul, the Seven Epistles of Ignatius, and the Epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians. Fake books. Uh, these pseudepigraphal books are often mentioned on the History Channel and the Discovery Channel on television as the lost books of the Bible. But I have news for you all. A uh, man might lose his keys. I might lose my wallet. I might lose my cell phone. God did not lose any of his books. I have a bulletin for you there, okay? There are no lost books of the Bible. These books have been rejected because they lack inspiration of the Holy Spirit and are fakes. As such, they do not meet the standards for canonicity. And once again, 1 Corinthians 14.33 says it this way, God is not an author of confusion. Satan is the author of confusion and the father of lies. God did not lose any of his books. God's word will not return to him void, but will accomplish what God pleases. Jesus said it this way. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but his words will not pass away. There are no lost books. There are excluded books because they were rejected, because they lacked inspiration, and they were written during the time when there was no prophet and no prophecy from God. Okay, now, God gave us a warning about adding to or taking away from his words in Revelation 22, 18 and 19. It goes like this. It says, Why well, testify unto every man that hears the words of prophecy, this book, that if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. The pseudepigraphal books were not written by God's prophets and intentionally used the names of key persons mentioned in the Holy Bible to gain credibility or, or to sound holy. None of the pseudepigraphal writers claimed that their writings were inspired by God. 
The pseudepigraphal books contain statements that contradict foundational biblical Christian doctrine found in the 66 canonized books. The pseudepigraphal books and the apocryphal books do not meet the standards for canonization and have been excluded from our Holy Bible. All right, Bible study students, let's do a brief summary of what we just learned about the principles used in the canon of Scripture. The first thing we talked about was that uh, there were certain standards of principles used in the 66 books that were included in the Bible, okay? And we talked about the fact that uh, uh, these books were uh, different from the Christian books, were different from the Jewish books in the Bible, and there's also a difference between the Catholic books in the Bible. We talked about that. We talked about comparing and contrasting those books. We talked about the intertestamental period. And remember, this period was when? After the end of who? Who was the last person in the Old Testament? That was Malachi, right? After Malachi wrote the last of the 39 books. Now, you guys remember that, right? And then before the writing about John the Baptist in the book of Luke. Okay? There was this 400-year period of time where God was silent. There was no prophet and no prophecy. And remember, we've already said that all scriptures God breathed. So, and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, so the holy man will be prepared to do the works that God has called them to do. We also said that no scriptures of any private interpretation, so holy man spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So what we're saying now, what the scriptures are saying about the scripture and about the inspiration of scripture, that the Holy Spirit inspired the writings for the Bible. So it's impossible if the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible and the Holy Spirit is quiet, then who's speaking? Man, not God. So those books are not inspired. So we talked about that, and therefore they were not included uh, in either the Jewish Bible or the Christian Bible. We talked about the fact that there are no lost books. Uh, I might lose my keys. I might lose my cell phone. But I got news for y'all. God would not lose any of his books. His word will not come back void. It will do what it is intended to do. We need to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. We talked about the canon as a rule or standard around church matters. Uh, we talked about also that um, the Holy Spirit is the author. We talked about prophecies contained in the books. We talked about the fulfillment of prophecy as a powerful way to prove the inspiration of Scripture. We talked about the fact that the uh, authors uh, uh, reference God in those books. Uh, we talked about the fact that there was an internal agreement in the 66 books. We gave examples of that. And we talked about the books are powerful and dynamic and sharper than the two-edged sword. We talked about it in Hebrews 4.12. Um, uh, so, uh, therefore, when we looked at the books that were included, we saw the standards. And we also understand the differences between the Jewish Bible and the Christian Bible. The Jewish Bible, the Christian Bible, and uh, the, the, uh, all three Bibles, all three agree on the 39 books. There's no debate about the 39 books in the Old Testament being inspired. The debate comes about the other 27 in the New Testament and then the seven additional books. That's where all of the discussion and disagreement comes in. Uh, the Jews are saying that the 27 in the New Testament uh, are not valid because Jesus Christ is not God. So they throw that out. Okay? They don't want to deal with that. Okay? The Catholics say, yes, the uh, 39 in the Old Testament are inspired and the 27 in the New Testament are inspired. So they agree with the Christian Bible, but to say, however, uh, we have books that say inspired that, you know, we can get, get money uh, from the dead and you can pray for the dead and you can pay for their salvation. Uh, we can pray to Mary. We have all those books are also inspired in our Bible, too. So that's the differences, basically, between those, okay? You know, Malachi was the last prophet in the Old Testament, and you know that uh, this 400-year period of time, we talked about again, it was called the Intertestamental Period, and that's when the books of the Apocrypha were written, and those are called the Hidden Writings, okay? And then we had also the Pseudepigraphal books, which were the false writings of people just put a name or something, made it sound holy, and wrote and said whatever they want to say, and then try to consider that as a book to be put in the Bible. And those were the books that you see on the Discovery Channel and the History Channel as the lost books in the Bible. So therefore, I hope that I've answered today the questions re regarding why we have 66 books in the Bible, what were the principles used to include those books in the Bible, and why other books that were written during the time that God was silent and there was no prophet or prophecy were not included in the Bible. So that was our lesson for today.
It was called Principles Used in the Canon of Scripture. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that you shall be saved. Because with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if after hearing today's lesson on the principles for the canon of Scripture, that you've decided to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, please repeat the salvation prayer. Heavenly Father, I confess that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ is God. And I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. I'm asking for salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. I pray that you create in me a clean heart and renew within me a right spirit. I pray that I will lead a new life that will honor and glorify you daily. In the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you, dear Lord. Amen. If you prayed that salvation prayer, I would like for you to go to my website at www.foundationalbtm.org. Click on the Salvation tab. There's a couple articles I need for you to read. One is called The Doctrine of Salvation. Now that you're saved, exactly what does that mean? You need to know that. You also need to know the ABCs of salvation, the foundational principles of salvation. And you also need to know the next steps after salvation. I can tell you what some of those next steps are. You need to start reading your Bible daily. You need to pray daily. You need to go to a church where Christ is being preached. You need to go to regular Bible study and fellowship. And you also need to be mentored or discipled by a seasoned Christian so you can grow in your faith. So he wants you to know what you believe, and we want you to know why you believe it. And for our listening audience and our viewing audience, I think you know that our foundational biblical teaching ministry needs for you to partner with us to help us continue to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can do that by going on our website at www.foundationalbtm.org. Make a tax-free donation of any amount that will help us to continue spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ so every nation and language and tongue will know the word of Christ and have the opportunity to be saved. So will you please partner with us? Will you help us to make a difference? I'm sure you will, and we're thanking you in advance of what you're going to do. So let's end this lesson with a prayer, and then let's briefly talk about next week's lesson. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our lesson on the principles that we use in the canon of Scripture. We thank you that your word would not go out void. It would do what it was intended to do. We thank you that we hear your voice and we know your voice and you know us, Heavenly Father, and we know your voice when we hear it. I pray that we'll make a difference while there's still time. I pray that the lost will be saved. I pray that the lost will be saved. And I pray that we'll make a difference while there's still time in your kingdom, for your glory, for your honor, for your praise. In the name of Jesus, dear Lord. Amen. So let's have a brief look at next week's lesson. Please share this video. Please bring a friend. Let's talk about next week's lesson. Do not miss this. In our next Jesus in Genesis broadcast, the climax of God's work in creation is found in Genesis 1, and that was the creation of mankind. Uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created he, him. Male and female created he them. And Genesis 2, 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So have a few questions, and you can be prepared next week. You can study ahead of me because you know we're going to be in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. So be ready for these questions, okay? And bring some friends next week. What does it mean to be made in God's image? Just one question we're going to answer. Another question. What responsibility do we have now that we've been made in God's image? Another question. Does being made in God's image mean that we are God's? 
Another question. What happens to our soul when we die? Or does our soul die with our body? Does our soul live for eternity? I'm glad you asked. We will answer these questions in our next broadcast, Mankind, the Climax of God's Word in Creation. This is Dr. Ben signing off for now. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Thank you for watching the Foundational Biblical Teaching Ministry, Jesus in Genesis broadcast. We pray this ministry would help you to grow in His Word and is making a difference in your life. Help us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and continue to develop Bible study lesson broadcasts. Please visit our website at www.foundationalbtm.org. Click on the donation tab and make a tax-free donation of any amount. Your generous support is greatly appreciated and will help us develop additional Bible study lessons. Share this video and bring a guest or group next week at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2 p.m. Central for our next Bible study lesson. May God bless you and keep you.